Hello everybody and welcome back to the Kamidoku Podcast. I am Krista Veljanovsky and joining me for yet another great episode is the man, the myth, the legend, Toasty. Toasty! Now if you're new here, be sure to subscribe or follow us to join the family. And if you're a regular, it's great to have you back. Either way, I'm sure you know at least one person who loves Mortal Kombat that hasn't heard of us. So if there's one favour I ask, please tell them about the show. Combatants, today is a humongous deal. Me and Christopher are absolutely honoured to be joined by a sensational producer. One that has skyrocketed with success and brought us some of the biggest classics around the globe. We're talking about the chairman and CEO of Threshold Entertainment, Lawrence Kasanoff. It is important to note that he also founded Lightstorm Entertainment with the distinguished James Cameron in 1990. As diehard Mortal Kombat fans, today is a day that we will never forget. Larry brought forward the martial arts and fantasy Mortal Kombat was a pinnacle. It was released to theaters in 1995. It left audiences exhilarated, withheld number one in the box office for three consecutive weeks and left everyone wanting more. Much to our delight, we've had many amazing features since then, spanning from additional films, iconic television series, and even a live tour. This is all thanks to the creative mind of Larry Kasanoff and all the hardworking people at Threshold Entertainment. We are forever grateful and appreciative of all the wonderful material that has been released by this company. With that being said, it is nothing short of a pleasure to continue on with this interview today. And away we go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, everyone. And here we are accompanied by Larry Kasanoff. Larry has been involved in some massive titles such as Terminator 2, True Lies, even dabbled in Star Wars and Marvel. But for today's interview, the emphasis is going to be based around a franchise that is a part of mine and Christopher's DNA, the very same franchise that molded our childhoods into something very special. We continue to talk about it daily and it plays a tremendous role in our lives. All of the Mortal Kombat community deeply appreciates your time today, Larry. And so with that being said, I wanted to be the first to say thank you for all the work you've done for this IP. And of course, appearing on today's special, we have a lot to get through, so I'm excited to continue on. Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you guys for all your support for Mortal Kombat over the years. It's never going to change, eh, Chris? <laughs> nope. that's, what, that's great. <laughs> that's what we like to hear. <laughs> so to begin this interview, perhaps we can start with where your passion for Mortal Kombat began. Furthermore, what led you to be so convinced that this was the franchise that could be successful in the movie industry? So here's the story. When we made Terminator 2, we also made an arcade game from it by the Williams Bally Midway did. And we made video games, and I became very friendly with the guys at, at Williams, Neil Castro and Roger Sharp and other guys. And I stayed in touch with them. And not too long after T2, they said to me, just in a casual conversation, sort of teasing me, we have a video game that's testing in an arcade in Chicago that looks like it's going to beat your record. And I said, well, can't have that. And I was actually going to go, <laughs> I was going to Chicago anyway. So I said, I'm going to come see you guys and play this thing. And I, I was in Chicago. I went to say hi to them, not intending to even know what it was, just kind of curious. And I played the video game in Neil Nicastro's office, who was the CEO then. And after I played the video game on the arcade for five minutes, I turned to him and I said, this has the potential to be Star Wars meets Enter the Dragon. And if you give me the rights, I guarantee you, I will not only make a movie, I will make a movie, an animated series, a TV series, a live tour. I'll put it in every medium in the world. And he looked at me and he said, piece of crap arcade game. And it took, me, it took me all summer to convince him that it was good. And everyone told me my career was going to be over. You know, I, I believe that if you want to do something great, you have to be a little crazy. I call it a touch of the madness. And everyone, you can't make a hit movie from a video game. All movies from video games fail. This is going to fail. But to me, I thought, you know what? If we take what is sort of 
a traditional stylic Hong Kong movie with great martial arts, and we Hollywood it up. You know, great effects, great music, gorgeous people, great locations. No, we can have something no one's ever done, and this is the vehicle to do it. Now, remember, the arcade game was testing well. Remember the old days of arcades? Where you yeah. actually had to go to a room and play something in a, you know, in a room. Anyway, but it, and it hadn't come out as a video game yet. So I finally got the rights. I quit my job. I bet everything on this. And wow. then when it came out as a home video game, it broke all kinds of records. And I had, I still had studios and people saying to me, this is great, but you can't make a movie out of a video game. But, you know, we did. But that, that was it. I, I went to play it. I loved it. I sat on the spur of the moment. I spent all summer fighting for it. I bet my job on it. I bet my career on it. I wow. just had a feeling this was the one. And, and the, by the way, my two favorite genres, you know, martial arts and, and sci-fi. So it was a great combination for me. Absolutely. Or martial arts and fantasy, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Um, now, I believe that the original 1990s film, um, the, the test audiences thought it was lacking in the fight scene department. Uh, exactly how much time and effort was put in to ensure fans were satisfied and how pleased were you with the final result? So the 1995 film was the first film. So, um, so the 1995, I'm sorry. So the 1995 film was the first film. Yes, we had a test audience, which is very important to me. And the test audience was very unanimous. Sometimes a test audience is all over the place with their answers. And in that case, it's hard to know what to do. But 99% of the audience said, we love the movie, we want more fights. So we went back to the studio and we, with a plan to shoot two more fights, which was the Scorpion Johnny Cage fight and the Reptile Liu Kang fight, which cost a lot of money and to the studio's credits, they greenlit it. And we shot those fights, which I think are probably the best two fights in the movie. Absolutely. And that turned the whole thing around. And how committed are we to the fans? 100%. To make a great movie, you have to ask yourself one question first. Who do you work for? The, I always tell my crews, they don't work for me, they don't work for the studio, they don't work for the director, we all work for the audience. When the audience says we want more fights, boy, we give more fights, and boy, were they right. Oh, so yeah. I, w I, was, I was thrilled with the, with the movie. It was, it was what was in my mind. You know, Sometimes in a movie, I have this moment where I see uh, something, like on a set or a shot, which is kind of the touchstone I had in, in my mind when I was sitting on my couch at home dreaming up the movie, and I go, I got it. And when we were shooting the reptile um, uh, Versus Liu Kang, Kang. fight, yep. yeah, th there's, there's a moment when Liu Kang kind of jumps on reptile's shoulders with his legs and flips him over backward as the lights are flickering off and on and it's all purple and i, I whoever was standing next to me i punched on the shoulder and i said got it because that 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 image was in my mind from day one wow and when i saw us doing it i just knew we had it brilliant you were on file to say that well before the finalized version of goro versus johnny cage there was actually another big fight scene planned for Johnny, but it was cut out because thematically it just didn't fit. Could you elaborate more on what that original pitch was? Well, th th there was going to be a bigger, like a more martial artsy fight with Goro and Johnny. But Goro was one of the last big actual animatronic characters built before everything went digital. And he was huge. And he had, he had four arms. You know, we were going to actually have Goro have a pet leopard. We oh. thought that would be great. Wow. And so we, 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 <laughs> we went and there was this great place near here that you know rented animals for the movies in the days before they were digital. And we got a leopard and we brought the leopard over. The leopard took one look at Goro and freaked out. <laughs> the, leopard, the leopard was scared to death. So there was clearly going to be no leopard. So when we were starting to shoot the fight, we thought, you know, there's no way this human being is going to out martial arts this guy. I, I always think in a martial arts movie, you, you can have lots of people you don't expect win as long as there's some rationale to it, you know, the, the, like a cobra fighting a mongoose. And so that's when we came across the idea that Johnny would be cool, would be cool, would be cool, and then we'd just punch Goro in the balls. And we just got the idea that it would be funny, it'd be interesting, it'd be cool, and it would it would be a break from the other fights. But honestly, it was really the only way we could think of to make it believable that Johnny beat him. Yeah. So that's why we did it. 
Nice. Very good. Uh, tell us a bit about some of the locations you chose to shoot in for the films and how different cultures came together to inspire the overall look. Uh, while Asian is clear, I believe that possibly you know Himalayan and even maybe Egyptian influences also came into the mix. Is that well? What we we want? I, I love to travel and I love shooting other cultures and I love showing the audience things they haven't seen and that's what we wanted to do. The the tagline to the first movie said, "Nothing is the in the world has prepared you for this," and I said from day one to the studio and everyone else. If in the first 30 seconds of the trailer, the audience doesn't say, I haven't seen anything like this before, we fail. So we went all over the world scouting for locations and looking for locations that were mystical and magical and foreboding, but kind of alluring. And we thought to ourselves, if you'd seen them in another movie, broadly, we can't shoot there. So we did that in both movies. And the, and the best story I think about shooting in these locations actually comes on the second movie. We were um, shooting in Jordan, and we had a mixed Jordanian, Israeli, British, American crew. Wow! And we were the only ones in the world to have done that at that point. You know, shoot with Israelis and Arabs in Jordan with Americans and British. And before we went there, I was sitting in my hotel room in, in London, thinking, "Can I do this?" Because there was a lot of unrest in the Middle East at that time. Should I do this? I mean, it's my crew, it's my idea, it's my movie. And then I thought, you know, the only way we'll ever get over all this kind of opposition is if people get to know each other. So we went. And we, the first day, we're in Petra, which is this, this magical, magical place in Jordan where a lot of the second movie is shot. We were in a little shop, and our prime kind of guide uh, from Israel was a woman named Eti, and she was talking to the shopkeeper in a bunch of different languages, and everyone was mingling. And it was really old, you know, in those days, the, even the shops around Petra were you know, dirt floors and stuff. And then they switched to English. And Eti says, so where are you from? And this was a long time ago, and there were a lot of tensions there. And, and he says, Baghdad, where are you from? And she said, Tel Aviv. And then you saw people kind of stop and look at each other and kind of back off. And then one said to the other, we're supposed to be enemies. And then you saw everyone kind of square off and you literally saw people kind of form fists. You know, am I next to an Israeli guy or an Arab guy, depending on who you are? And it was complete silence. And then one of the two of them said, eh, politicians. And they hugged and everyone applauded and we, and it, we got along great. And everyone, someone brought out, you know, drinks and tea and everyone got along great. We actually wrote that story in an editorial um, for USA Today when we got back. Everyone got along great when we just went with one mission, which was to tell a great story. That is absolutely incredible. Wow. Yeah. And even in going to Jordan, you know, so Petra in Jordan is, is, a, is a city of the Nabataeans that's 2,000 years old and had been largely lost to civilization, to Western civilization from around 100 AD to the late 1800s when a British explorer went through posing as an Arab because you weren't supposed to go there if you weren't Arabic and, and then reported back that it existed. But still, it's called, the, it's called the Red Rock City half as old as time. Still, you couldn't really go there. And still, even into modern days, to a few years before I got to Israel to go look for it, Israeli guys sometimes in the army to try and be macho and prove they were cool would try and sneak into Jordan and see the city. And if caught, it, you know, not good. And it, and, and it had recently opened up the Jordanian and Israeli border only a few years earlier. And all we had was one picture from an old newspaper that said, you know, Petra now opened to Jordan. And no one in Israel really knew what was there. And I thought there's got to be more than this one temple that was in the Indiana Jones movie, which we didn't use. And we went and, and our tough Israeli guides, you know, trying to hide it. But when they walked into Petra, they were crying because this is where their ancestors for thousands of years would be killed just by walking in. And now we can go in and shoot a movie together in the Red Rock City half as old as time, which we did. Wow. Amazing. Quite the story. So how about we discuss the incredible cast in all these Mortal Kombat projects? A lot of them have had uh, impressive resumes and brought so much new life to an already rich franchise. Uh, a number who have become very successful to this day actually began in your Mortal Kombat productions what do you think it is particularly that really made this cast shine in these type of roles? 
I think that there's, there's a creative and a business answer to that, the, the, and they tie together. The business answer is, as the franchise got more and more famous, the needs of having a famous cast, which a financier or distributor wants, so the audience is familiar with the movie, start to go away. It's like what happens in a Marvel movie today, although they have a great cast who's somewhat known, it, it wouldn't matter because it's Marvel, so anyone is going to go. In other words, Spider-Man is or Batman are more famous than anyone who can play them. So that happened to us too. And, and, and that gives you great creative freedom as a filmmaker to then go and get just who you want. And, and, and after the fight test results and what happened in the first movie, all the various studios and TV people we work with started to understand my one demand, which is we have the best fighters in the world. And here's my rule in these fights. You haven't seen the fight move, but you see the fight move, meaning it's a new move, but it isn't cut, cut, cut. If like Liu Kang runs and jumps on Reptile's shoulders, he did it. And we would literally scour the world for people who could do amazing things. And I like extremes. And so because we had the financial and business freedom to cast who we wanted, we could get people who for one reason or another, their fight moves, their charisma, their stunning looks, their acting ability were different and extreme. Because if you have a movie where you're saying, this is another world, no one is prepared for this, these are the best warriors in the world, the audience has to believe it and you have to show yes. it. So we found people who had extremes that we didn't play it safe and as a result, when you cast for extremes, you, that's where you often find great talent. So when we got, you know, we used to call him Hollywood, but Tony Ja, who we, we put in his first movie in the second Mortal Kombat movie, you know, we were just auditioning guys and we saw this guy do these amazing things. <laughs> he backflipped down a sort of pyramid. Yeah. You're like, holy crap. So boom, you got him and you're going to bring this guy in. And um, we put Eva Mendez actually on the Mortal Kombat TV series, Conquest. Yes. That was her first job. And um, our casting directors at the time, Robin and Heidi Klein, came to me and said, you have to cast this woman. She's incredible. I, I honestly didn't quite see it at first, but then they showed me because she wasn't a fighter, but there was something about her vibe and her empathy. And, and it was her first job, and I'm sure she was nervous, but we cast her. So we had the freedom to take chances and be a little crazy and be extreme. And that's why we got so fortunate in casting such great people. So it makes me really happy to know that uh, Mortal Kombat has officially been named, you know, the 16th biggest IP in the United States, um, which is a massive deal and, and huge achievement. So uh, how does that make you feel? You know, it makes me feel great. It, it's wonderful. It, it, it's I, I love it. I always think of you in the future and the next movie and the next this and so forth. But I still remember sometimes when I hear that, you know, running around trying to convince people that this arcade game, which was going to be a video game, would be a great franchise, even though no one even knew what it was. You know, there's one studio, I won't say what studio okay. it was, when, when the video game of the arcade game came out, they called me right away and they said, you've got to come up. You, you, we've got to talk about this. And I went and they said, I was with a million of them, and they said, congratulations. I said, thank you. They said, you got this. I said, thank you. They said, now what is this again? And they said, it's a video game. And they said, oh my God, that's great. Congratulations. What's a video game? And I, and I tried to explain to them, but they hadn't played one. Remember, this was 1994. And so we got in a little you know, golf cart and drove around the lot looking for someone who could play the Mortal Kombat games. Finally, in the merchandising department, they found in another building someone who had a video oh, game wow. machine. They played the game for two minutes and looked at me and said, thanks for coming. <laughs> that was it. So, so it's wonderful because I, I still have the perspective of where it came from. So it makes it a little bit more wonderful for me because I, I, I still remember the evolution. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I mean, I think it's a lot of it's credited down to the amazing fights that are in all the movies. Um, what do you believe in your eyes are the most recognizable, ambitious fights that were filmed? Well, that's a good question. I, 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 I am a huge fan of so many of the fights I, I mean, personally, like I said, as I said, I like the two extra fights we shot in the first movie. I like the fight on the ice bridge in the second movie. They do these double and triple flips together. Um, 
I think if you really actually go back and watch the TV series where we had to do three fights in a week, yes, uh, that just the general quality of these fights, a lot of them uh, were were really amazing. Um, but but in general, they they were all great because they are authentic. If someone we didn't trick them, no matter what you saw, someone did it, and that's really wherein the secret lies. We had great fighters on the set who could do great things. And, you know, you don't um, get a Taekwondo guy whose Taekwondo is kicking and have him punch all day or her punch all day. So you get people who can do a certain skill you want or you tailor the fight to their skill. So that's something else we did too. The other thing we did on the movies and the shows that not a lot of people, if anyone does, is we had a continuous fight unit shooting the entire movie. It wasn't like a second unit would come in and occasionally shoot. There were always two units shooting the entire time. The fights were incredibly important. We would fly people in for a shot. If you know, there's someone from some country who could do one amazing move, we would fly them in for that shot. Mm -hmm. And as I said, every place we went, we, we auditioned. We were just always looking, 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 looking to find local and new talent. And we found it everywhere we went in the world. So it was really being respectful to the martial arts. We had phenomenal trainers. We had phenomenal choreographers. We called people in all the time. Uh, I know you you've, you've in, you, know, you guys have uh, interviewed some of them. And they're just, they're in real life great fighters. And that was the number one thing. I can't stand martial arts movies where it's just a barrage of hands and fists flying and then someone is on the ground. And we did the opposite. So it was of all about authenticity, That's why they're really. All about authenticity yes. in the fights. Now, and then, and then you surround those fights with, you know, beautiful locations and great effects and great costumes. But I would rehearse and approve all the fights in a gym. We knew exactly what we were shooting before we shot it. And I, I had a rule to myself. That fight had to look great in the gym. Right. And if it didn't look great in the gym without anyone around it, then, you know, the, the, all the icing on the cake was exactly that icing on the cake but the fight in itself had to look good no matter where you saw it and it was incredible and we were constantly looking for new moves in fact i started a kind of little game with all the the, the guys that every time i came on the set i would say move of the day and they'd have to teach me one move that morning <laughs> and eventually eventually we did a tv show called move of the day <laughs> where we had all these famous martial artists come in and teach people moves which is actually very successful for a while yeah wow. Uh, so, Larry, Christopher and I, along with all of our audience, really enjoy a good laugh. What would you say are some of the funniest moments that still linger from your time working on any of these Mortal Kombat projects? Oh, that's a great question. You know, there are little moments that often come in the midst of, of, of these crazy things. But, for example, Christopher Lambert, who played Raiden in the first movie is really a hysterical guy. I tried to convince him for years he should do a comedy. And what he would always do when he was in a scene is when the camera wasn't on him, but you, know, you still act opposite the actor, he would always make faces and, and pretend to be mocking the guy. So when no one can see, he was trying to crack up the entire crew, which he would often do. And in fact, there's a line in the first movie where he says, the fate of the world depends upon you. <laughs> and he goes and cracks up. So sorry. sorry, sorry. He ad-libbed that line. Yeah, that's right. He was just funny about it. Yeah, he I lived it. The other thing that I like the best is uh, in the first movie we shot on the island of Krabi in Thailand for a while, which is a stunningly gorgeous island in, in southern Thailand and, and in this gorgeous uh, in, 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 in gorgeous bay, Panga Bay. And we all had these little kind of bungalows on this island. And to get to their hotel, you had to take a little boat. And there were monkeys all over the place in the trees. Well, for some reason, the monkeys hated Lyndon Ashby, who was really <laughs> funny as hell. They just didn't like him. And they would surround Lyndon's bungalow and throw coconuts <laughs> at him. So, so Lyndon was always late to set, and he would used to say, it's the monkeys. The monkeys don't like me. And we thought he was just, Oh, you know, Johnny Cage. Overseeing. But actually, yeah, yeah, Johnny Cage. But it actually turned out to be true. The monkeys did like him. And Johnny also, I mean, he was just a funny, 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 funny guy. So a lot of those lines, like, you go first. Were, were ad lib by him as well. They were just, it was just funny people. You know, we also did something you don't usually do on movies, on the first movie. Usually on movies, you go to location first and then you come home to 
to um to your sets. We did it the other way around. So to the crew, that meant everyone in the crew had a ticket home from Thailand. And so when the movie was done, it was a very easy way to take a little vacation because you you know you already had the ticket home and so the crew was in a great mood the whole time because the movie was so fun. The other thing that happened was no one really believed the movie was going to work. And even though New Line was great and did it, and, you know, it, 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 it just, it, remember, it was, no one had ever been successful in a video game movie. And so now, especially for the last half of the movie, we're on location, sort of, you know, quote by ourselves. So it was sort of like, you know, letting the kids go wild. And it was just a blast. I mean, we were just all having a great time because we were shooting these gorgeous places. It was clear the movie was working. The crew was great. A lot of people got their first or second shots in movies, which means everyone just worked really, really hard. So it was a phenomenal, phenomenal effort. And the places we went, especially in the first movie, Thailand, the Thai people were so nice and so welcoming and so wonderful. Yeah. It was just one of those incredible parties, kind of, where everything worked well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I understand you're still pretty close with uh, Chris Casamasa to this day. Uh, is there anyone else from the cast that you still, you know, frequently keep in touch with? Yeah, I, I am uh, close to Chris. I'm close to Dana He, who played Melina in the second movie, and who and Sion. <laughs> uh, was and played Sion. Thank you in the in the TV series. I'm, I'm close to Daniel Bernhard, who's gone on to be in the Matrix and movies like that, and, and a bunch of other people. We we see a lot of them. It's kind of like you know your college class. We we see a lot of these people and still use them. We're going to put. Um, we haven't announced this yet, but we're we're doing. We're going to do a movie with Dana about her life story, Ooh. and we're we're about to put Chris in a new movie. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> yeah. So that so 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 that those, those things are great. And you know you know what I you, sorry I don't know if you heard that I said you know what I I'd like to ask you guys if it's okay I'm curious sure, absolutely so we. we one of the first, we had a lot of firsts with Mortal Kombat. It was the first movie from the video game. It was the first million selling electronic dance music album. Yes. It was also the first movie ever to use a website in its advertising and it's on its poster. We had mortal.com, mortalkombat.com for years. And one of the things I started doing with mortalkombat.com is I realized, hey, if I'm trying to decide some question about a movie or the animated series or the live show, you could just ask the audience on mortalcombat.com and the next day we get a thousand answers. Yes, you put polls and such. So, yeah. 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 So, so I'm, I'm really interested in that. So I, I'm, I'm very interested in audience feedback and I, like I said with the testing. So, you know, we're going to do a martial arts movie, not Mortal Kombat, okay. which is a very wild, it's called the Fort, it's called the Fearless and the Fallen. It's a very wild, wild, wild fantasy martial arts movie, but it is sexy and R rated and it's gorgeous fantasy. It's kind of like Euphoria meets a uh, martial arts movie. Okay. I'm curious if the Mortal Kombat fans want a movie like that. And and and, and you can always reach me on Larry.Kazanoff, which is my Instagram, and, and just leave a comment. And I'm, re I'm really curious because, as I said, I love the opportunity of interacting with fans, not only to answer questions like this, but to say, okay, well, what do you want next? What do you want to see? What, what do you want out there? Well, there you go, guys. Said from Larry himself. Um, so reach out and, yeah. I, I'd love to hear your opinions on that, but I can say for myself and judging by Chris's reactions already, I would absolutely <laughs> love to see something of that sort. I think that sounds wonderful, Larry. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And we have these phenomenal designers. Louis Royo is a, and his son are the artists behind it. There's some stuff on my um, Instagram about it. it it's, a, it, it's really, really wonderful. So you'll hear more about it soon, but it, it's something that's really never been done before. And mm. it's... A bit wild and crazy, but I like that. And so I'm really yeah. curious about it. And so again, so so Chris is going to be in it. He plays a great role. You'll get a kick out of it. A lot of the other Mortal Kombat people are involved in it. I see these mm. guys and, and guys, I mean, you know, men and women all the time. Lots of them. Wow. So as executive producer for the newer Mortal Kombat 2021 film, what would you say are some of the biggest strengths of this newer iteration? You know... That movie did great during the pandemic theatrically, and it was HBO Max's. It was it was announced as HBO Max's 
number one streaming movie of the year. Yes. I think it was number one streaming movie of the year of their new theatrical releases. And so obviously I'm you know biased, but you're thrilled with a movie and thrilled at the audience reaction to it. And I think there's two reasons for it. One is because it, it is of itself is a great movie. But two, I think it really speaks to how much the audience loves Mortal Kombat. They just couldn't wait to go back and see another Mortal Kombat movie, which is incredibly gratifying. And I think the movie, again, didn't pull any punches. It didn't hold back. No. I, I, we, we, we have reached a time in the world where everyone is very nervous and it's very politically correct. And without being political, just as a filmmaker, you can't make art under constraints like that. And whenever you say, let's go for it, people, I think, love it. I said earlier, that's why we got great cast. And I think that movie did it. It just went for it. It was just a blast and it was extreme and it was wonderfully violent. And yeah. I, and it was Mortal Kombat. And I think the audience spoke. Absolutely. Um, so you've created and co-created stories for practically all of your Mortal Kombat productions. Um, if you really had to think about it, um, what are some of the moments that make you most proud uh, that you had a hand in shaping? Well, uh, this is a question, so I don't want to sound even more arrogant than I am. You know, I, I was obviously, I, you know, I thought up the whole thing and I was involved in all of it. So with a wonderful, 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 wonderful group of people. You know, this comes from Ed Boon and John Tobias and the guys at Midway. And I, I, I think the thing I'm most proud of is that, remember, I, I started this myself. I quit my job to do it. And, and I'm most proud of the amount of people who wound up coming on board and the great group we have and still gathered. So we had great writers like, like, like Sean Derrick, who wrote, and show ran our two series yes. and great choreographers and great directors and in other words we built a phenomenal creative team and i am most proud of what that team did and you know i i often don't ever go back and watch anything i've produced once it's done and i don't know why i just never do but during the pandemic when hbo max started airing conquest which i hadn't seen in years i thought all right i'll watch five minutes of it because i never watched my own stuff as i said i watched the entire series again and i was honestly astonished at what a great job sean the showrunner did yes because i thought it was i loved it and i didn't even remember some of the storylines but i just thought it was fantastic and we made that for so little money so seeing something i hadn't seen in so long which i didn't expect to see and being so proud of it is it so i don't think there's one moment i think the answer is i'm proud of the team we assembled and of the great work they did on everything the animated series the live series the tour all the other things we've done you know do you know the story of the album did anyone ever tell you this the story the, of the, the first album the first, yeah so, so in the first movie we wanted to use you know edm electronic dance yeah. music which had never been done yeah and i have phenomenal partners in my business, Jimmy Einer, my partner, is one of the most legendary music producers in the world. And so we had this great deal at Sony. I mean, phenomenal deal, tons of money. But I don't want to say the artist because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But when we walked in, they said, and they gave us these kind of, um, they wanted to kind of use these speed metal guitarists. And we said, um, no, 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 electronic dance music. And they said, what the hell is that? And we, we get kicked out of Sony. And then we go to Virgin, still a good deal not as good and virgin again offers us this kind of great pop singer who's wonderful but like no it, it's 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 mortal Kombat, electronic dance music no yeah. we're out of them and so we wound up going to this little company which never you know hadn't any, done anything like this which we essentially gave the album to for no advance and it became the first million selling album so platinum. so we kept platinum platinum album. so we kept believing and believing and believing in, in these things and in what we wanted to do from the stories to the music to the locations to the costumes and it was that attention to detail not just by me but by the, everybody the whole cast and crew that has made it successful and that's what i'm most proud of if i call chris casamasa tonight 
And I said, I need you tomorrow morning for something oh. during Mortal Kombat. He'd go, yes, sir. Where should I be? 110%. Oh, yeah. That's what's great about it. We know, Chris. You don't get he would. <laughs> you could. You, and you don't, and, you, and you, you don't get that on every movie. No. So it, it's the crew. It's the group. It's the cast. It's the crew. It, it's the distributors. It, it's the studio. It, it just, it's a great group. In Mortal Kombat Annihilation, there were a few scenes that sadly didn't end up happening for the movie. However, it is true that the original ending consisted of Quan Chi and Shinnok discussing in the Netherrealm. There have been set photos and even an image of the scene from a released magazine. Do you think there's a possibility that fans will ever get to properly view this scene? I don't think so. Ah. Um, <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you, you know, Mortal Kombat Annihilation was very, very, very ambitious. And I'm, I'm saying what I'm about to say as a, as a fastidious perfectionist producer. So take it with a bit of a grain of salt. But in my opinion, we, we never got a chance to completely finish the visual effects in the movie uh, um, because I didn't think they were done well enough, but the studio said the movie's going to be a hit. You're done, which, you know, from a studio is their right and their prerogative and their business perspective to say, and they were right. It was the number one movie again, but it, it, it you know, wherever I got a, a little extra time or money, I tried to re-perfect those as opposed to add scenes. Cause remember every time you shoot a scene, because if you shot it and it has effects in it, you're talking about more money. And yeah. so part of your game as a producer is you it's always a time versus money versus creativity issue, always. And so the question is, if you have $10 and four days and six effect shots, how do you want to use them? You can make one day great or you can make all days okay. Or So there's always a compromise that has to go. And it, 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 it happens on, on pretty much in all movies. I mean, even huge expensive movies, it happens. And so everyone with the best of intentions came to this kind of compromise situation that is the movie you see today. And in that arena, there was really no place to do anything more than, than we did. So I don't even, I mean, I don't even know where that footage is to tell you the truth. Maybe someone else does, but I don't. So I doubt it would come up, uh, but yeah. you know, that, that's okay because I, I kind of believe in movies, you know, once they're done and out, they're not mine anymore. They're they're the world's, and I want the world to believe in them. And I don't I don't like saying on movies. No, but here's what I intended. And here's why it doesn't matter what I intended. I was just telling a director of a current movie of something we're finishing right now. It doesn't matter what we intended. We're, we're done. You know, you, you set your ship to sail, and out it goes in the ocean. And it's whatever the people who see it believe in it. So that's the movie. And the notion that it could have been this scene or it could have been that scene, it wasn't. It is what it is. And how do you interpret it? I, I've had lots of movies of mine interpreted in a way that I thought, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> That's oh, interesting. Yeah. But if people think it, you just want them to enjoy it. So I don't, I don't love the speculation of what might have been because it wasn't. And so for all intents and purposes, I can, you know, no one ever feels sorry for, for I think, for fashion models or movie producers. So I can say all day long, oh, we should have had this and we wanted that. It doesn't matter. The movie's great. It was another number one movie. Everything we've done in Mortal Kombat has opened at number one. Everything. I'm so grateful for that, I can't tell you. So I, I don't spend a minute of time thinking, well, what could have been if we added another scene? Because sure. we didn't. Yeah. Uh, I understand that you actually, uh, second unit, directed some scenes from both the first and second movies. Um, what was it like um, doing that? And what sort of key moments were you involved in? So in the first movie when when we got back home and all the fights and things had been shot and it was quick and remember it was all over the world we realized that in cutting the fights together we we didn't have enough close-up shots for what we wanted because you, you never know i mean you you you, you there, there's an old saying in movies that they're never as good as the dailies and it's never they're never as bad as the first cut so in the dailies, you convince yourself, oh my God, we're geniuses. We shot someone saying hello. It's beautiful. Oh my God, did you see the way they said hello? And then you see the first assembly and it's never as good as the final movie. But we did realize not only did we need more fights, we didn't have enough close-up shots. 
So on a stage in Van Nuys, when and where we were shooting the Johnny Cage and um, Liu Kang new fights, we set up little small areas to mimic all the other fights that we shot around the world to shoot insert or close-up shots. And we storyboarded them like you do, and then with the insert, and I think I forget the number, we shot like dozens or even hundreds a day while we were shooting the other fight scenes, and I shot those. And why did I shoot those? I mean, I'm, you know, I've made a lot of movies and I'm pretty good with a lot of different things in movies, but we shot those because everybody in every Mortal Kombat movie pitched in to do everything they could. So, you know, that's what I said. We had a great group and a great crew and no one was above or below anything. So I shot those and it was a blast and people were so helpful and it worked. So a lot of the shots you see in those movies, like you'll see, you'll see a, a fight in Thailand and then a close up of, of Sonya Blade slugging Kano, that close up was shot in Van Nuys. Okay. And you can't tell because we put palm trees in the back and they're in focus. On the second movie, it was a little more complicated. We were all over the world. We were doing crazy stunts all over the place. And so um, a lot of the stuff uh, and the fights in those movies, I shot, again, for the same reason. It, it, was, it was simply to try and help out any way anyone and everybody could. And again, we had such great martial arts. It was wonderful. The shot, the, the, the shot on the ice bridge, um, you know, where with um, Scorpion and Sub-Zero, Scorpion and Sub-Zero, yeah, where, you know, they're fighting each other. And they double flip in the air and hit each other. And one jumps on the other's shoulders and runs over him. And there was a bridge that was slippery, that was 20 feet high. And what those guys did was just absolutely, absolutely remarkable. Yes. You know, there's another thing that we had some Hong Kong stunt guys, too. And the Hong Kong stunt guys were incredible. And when we were building those interior cliffs that were 20-something feet high, but they weren't done. So when you build a... A fight scene like that and you know what you're doing from day one you build pads into the set so a rock might look like a rock but it actually is padded so the stunt guy knows he can fall on that and then jump on something else we hadn't done that yet it was just scaffolding and two by fours and i was on a ladder 20 feet high with this guy we used to call jack who was one of the hong kong stunt guys and i was pointing to him what would happen once the set was built and the pads were in he would go from the top he would hit here he would hit here, he would fall on the ground. I was just pointing. And then I turned around and I heard a scream, like, ah, and a thud. And he thought I meant do it now, but there were no pads. <laughs> the guy <laughs> threw himself off a 22 foot ladder onto a concrete floor. And it was like, oh my God. Oops. And he was fine. But it, it, they were amazing. But that incredible devotion can lead to crazy, maybe not so smart things. And my example of it is, there were a lot of falls in high falls, which are really dangerous into at any kind of high falls are dangerous into uh, airbags. And at one point we had a new stunt guy on from London who was great, but I didn't know him. And actually it was Dana who was about to jump in it. And I said, no, 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 I'm not having any of my, I was shooting second unit. None of my crew is going to do this unless I do it first. I have a, how do you fall into a stunt bag, into, a, into an airbag? And the guy said, well, you tuck your head. I said, I'm doing it first. And as I'm sailing through the air, so, you know, into the, spirit of the troops and we're all going to work together i'm thinking what the hell am i doing i don't know how to fall into a high fall <laughs> this is the stupidest thing i've ever done in my life and and you know thank goodness it worked out okay but 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 you know when the notion of you know shooting seven days a week all over the world and not sleeping you you start to get a little too, <laughs> a little too into it so the second movie was a little crazy that way on the tv wow. series we were organized as can be now we've done it a few times we were we shot it um at Disney World in yeah. uh, in Florida, and um, we, we had a phenomenal group and a second unit crew shooting the entire time. And again, three fights a week, and, and we did it, and that was wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderfully organized. Yes, yeah, it was a, it was a consistent formula. It was a beautiful show. Um, actually, in the last episode, you guys even had five fight scenes, I believe. So that must have been. Oh, is that really good? Yeah, job. you had five fight scenes <laughs> in the final one. <laughs> that, that, that's great. They were great. These guys were just yeah. great. Larry, and again, we we, fought, we we flew stunt people in from all over the world for those fights. We would fly someone in for two, for two days just because they could kick better than someone else or they could do a flip better than someone else. 
that show honestly has some of the best fights I've ever seen in my entire life. Like uh, like Spitfire Brown or Percy Brown when he played Rain, that was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah. There was so, yeah, there's a guy there was a guy we used to use named Master Kimball Sultan, who okay. was oh, a uh, yes, year. he played New Saiba. Yeah. Yes, and he was a capoeira guy from Brazil. Oh my God, this guy was incredible. You, you, you know, when I did move of the day with him, before you could get out the word "move of the day," he'd already hit you three times and was behind you. It was <laughs> it, it, it was incredible. Yeah, he yeah he was gnarly. He also played one of the shadow priests in uh, in the yes. final app. Yeah, he, you're right. Yes, he's right. phenomenal. Phenomenal, great sister, and they're all great. Yeah, surely. So you've brought up to me previously that you have a very specific fight scene philosophy that basically only you use. Why don't you elaborate to our audiences today on what exactly that is? Well, so I, I've touched on it during this conversation. So the, 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 okay. the two things that I, the one thing that I like to do, my rule is you haven't seen the move, but you see the whole move, meaning the move is new. I don't want to see something that other people have seen. But we do it. If we can't figure out how to have someone actually do it, and I don't really even like wires, we don't do it. But meaning we don't fake it. So again, if someone is going to run and jump on someone's shoulders, they're going to do that. And we're going to see the move in a wide shot. So we understand that it happened. I don't think the audience is familiar with editing terms and says this is a wide shot and I understand it. But deep down, I believe they again know the authenticity. So that's what we do. And the way we do it is by having a continuous or contiguous second unit the entire movie. You are always rehearsing, training, uh, storyboarding, fighting, and, and then shooting it. So it is an incredible concentration on fight scenes. And there's a lot of movies, big, huge movies that I didn't do, but I know the stories, which I won't ruin, where a fight scene wound up being shot in two hours. We don't do that. We absolutely make sure the fight scene is paramount. And sometimes it is hard to convince various studios and financiers that I need this many days for each fight scene. And is there a difference between this guy's kick and that guy's kick? And do we really have to fly someone in from Romania just because they can do backflips better than someone else? And the answer is yes, 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 yes. hundred times yes. Audience tells us that all the time, and that's what we do. So it's this incredible attention to detail and time and effort and even money on it, but it's also making sure you actually see that a move was actually done by martial artists. And I feel that way for two reasons. One, because it's spectacular. But two, you know, people always say, if this was the first hit movie from a video game, how come? How did you make a hit movie from a video game? I believe the secret is, I didn't make a hit movie from a video game. I made a hit movie from a video game, from the story that I believe, I made a hit movie from the story I believe the video game was based on. You have to ask yourself, what's the essence of this game or IP property? So in other words, you would tend to, let, let's say an IP is a pyramid, and you would say the video game in Mortal Kombat's case is the top. In my impression and view of it, it's not. It's one rung down. The top is the essence, the underlying story and feel. Why, why was Mortal Kombat and is Mortal Kombat such a successful game? And if you get that essence right, it will then in, in, imbue and flow into all the incarnations. And I believe the essence of Mortal Kombat is empowerment. At the end of the day, martial arts teaches you don't have to be the biggest or the strongest. If you study hard and do the right thing, you can beat a bigger opponent. And that's very empowering. And the games, if you think about it, are phenomenally good at making you feel that way. One of the ways I decided that summer I was trying to convince Neil Castro and Midway to give me the rights to bet everything on it is I was wandering around in an arcade in Los Angeles and an 11-year-old kid challenged me to Mortal Kombat, meaning he slapped a quarter down on the game and he looked up to me and he said, I challenge you to Mortal Kombat. And I said, okay. And the kid beat the hell out of me. I mean, he was great. And he just beat the hell out of me. And you know the game, it makes you feel good when you win. Sub-Zero wins, yeah. flawless victory. And the kid left feeling 10 feet tall and then and there I decided I was going to do it. So, so now wow. back to the fight. If you say, this is really about a palm, we have to show the audience that you can do this and the way, the way that, you know, Liu Kang, who's human, can be reptile is because he can do this. You have to show it. And if you don't show it, you might sort of imply it, but they'll never feel it. And if you show it and they feel it, they'll win. And you asked earlier about the test screenings where they want more fights. When I have the test screenings of a fight movie, an action movie, I sit in the front of the audience 
with a little chair facing the audience. I watch the audience the entire time. And if they are moving to the fight scenes and their hands go up, kind of their fists come up, and they're kind of fighting along with it, you got them. And, and, and if they don't, they don't. And when you watch them, the people actually do these moves and you see that they did it, you get that reaction from the audience. So that's why we do it and that's why it's so important to me. Incredible. One of the best things about Mortal Kombat to me is simply the unique characters and their back lore. From the television series, we've gotten some fabulous additions within your productions, such as Komodai, Asgarth, Vorpax, Kriya, etc. Is there a small chance uh, for any of these original characters developed to possibly end up in a new video game or feature film down the line? That's a really good question. I can't answer it specifically, but here's the second question I'll ask. If you want them, you hit me up on Instagram and tell me which ones you want to see more of. Oh, you hear that, guys? Participate. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Do it. Um, so you, you touched on it earlier, but um, 2021's Mortal Kombat movie was hugely popular on HBO Max last year. Um, and obviously there is an announced sequel coming. Um, is everyone excited to return again for this sequel? You know, I, I, I'm sworn to secrecy, so I can't really talk about the sequel. But, I mean, I, I, you know, my opinion, yes, of course, people are excited because, it, you know, it's a great franchise that is fun and continuing to do great. And nothing is more gratifying than an audience reaction, especially during a pandemic. To make people enter, to entertain people during a pandemic is just wonderful. So I think it's got a lot of momentum and that's exactly what you want. And that's a wonderful position to be in. And that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So let's go back to Mortal Kombat Conquest. Uh, this show in particular is my personal favorite. Uh, it's played a tremendous role in my life. And uh, I can currently look at a gigantic poster of the cast uh, just <laughs> ahead to the right of me right now. <laughs> um, Let's dive deeper into this production. How was it shot? Uh, how it still holds up, clearly, the legendary cast, and most importantly, season two. We all want it, Larry. <laughs> Again, hit me up. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, so, so when we came up with the idea for it and how we would position it and where we would make it, you know, the idea was that the movies are current and the, live action tv series is a number of years ago and there was also an animated tv series was at a different time in history that's how we divided it up and the for the at the beginning the studio actually wanted me to go to new zealand which is wonderful and it's great but my my concern with going to new zealand was as i said we constantly have to fly in guest stars and fly in uh, martial artists for one or two days and New Zealand was just too far to do that in any economic way but it was hard to convince the studio so I got on a plane and I went to Florida to Orlando and I, I held a press conference and I said to everybody everybody who came the mayor everybody I said I've got it was, it was, a, it was a, a, a little under a million dollars an episode so I've got 22 million dollars I can spend here but you all have to do this you all have to cut your prices by I think it was 20% I said, but if you do, we will guarantee you something like 40 weeks of work. And most, you know, most people in that, like if you say to a, a SAG actor in that part of town, in that part of the world, in those days, or a costumer, you know, they work one week a year and we guarantee them work. Everyone cut their prices and, and agreed to do it. The, the mayor chipped in money, except by the way, I think the stunt guy, the local stunt guys union didn't, which was actually okay because we had to fly in stunt people from all over the world anyway. So, so we, we, we did it in Florida. And it was so important to me, not because we like Florida better than New Zealand or this place better than that place, but for the reason I said. So we could constantly find guest stars and guest martial artists. And then yeah. we got this great deal to shoot at the MGM uh, film part of, of, of Disney World. And they, the sets were just gorgeous. And what they do is they give you a great deal if you'll let the audience who comes to Disney World in this kind of observation booth watch you shoot every day, which I thought was really fun because you could then talk to the audience too. So we did. So we had a great place and a great group. And, and so now we were set up in terms of the shooting. And again, using the two units at the same time, which is rarely done and running people back and forth is how we organized it. 
Sean, Catherine, Derek, who is a phenomenal writer, genius talent, my partner in a lot of projects, um, John Derek's daughter, uh, became the de facto showrunner. And we just came up with the arc and the stories. And not only did we want the fights great, we wanted it to be wild and we wanted it to be a little bit sexy and we wanted it to be a little bit dangerous. And we wanted to convey that they didn't really know what they were doing. We really liked the idea that that, that, that you know the the main three characters just were hanging on. I mean, they were not these terribly experienced people, and they were not necessarily yeah. going to win all the time. So, with that premise, there's a lot you can do in in a world like that. Like, for example, when I when I look back on the series, I told you I haven't watched in years. I, I, I Vorpax was so. I mean, they were all great, but Vorpax was so good, and I had forgotten Tracy how Douglas. Good, yeah, Tracy Douglas was so good. And that storyline was so interesting when you looked into it because there were a lot of twists and turns to it. So yes. we wanted to make sure they made mistakes. I mean, they all did make mistakes, mm -hmm. and 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 that yep. was and that was um, in, important too. And it was just a you know a series. Any series is is just a constant kind of assembly line full of work where we were uh, shooting in Florida and doing post in LA and and. And, and constantly bringing in different martial artists and different actors. That's where we brought in Eva Mendez. And remember, you know, Christina Loken, that was, I think, her first or second big part ever. And we just got these wonderful... She was like 19. Yeah, she was 19. We just got these wonderful guest stars. You know why I cast Christina? We, 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 love, why? we, we love putting new people in these movies. We, we still look for models or new people who haven't acted to put in in new movies. In the movie I mentioned, The Fearless and the Fallen, we're doing that because, again, we're saying new things to audiences. She was great. And her performance was great. I, I, always yes. have, I always have dogs. I always have dogs. And at the time, I had this great, wonderful um, dog named Kylie, who was a black, half lab, half wolf, or wherever I found Kylie. And Kylie was just a remarkably smart dog, very playful, and, and very forward. And Kristana, I remember, she had just done her audition, and she nailed down to tie her shoe as she was leaving. And Kylie walked up to her, put his like one leg on her knee, you know, kind of stood up and just stared at her like right in the eyes, like nose to nose for some reason. And I, and I thought, I wonder what Kylie's doing that. Kylie had a very good judge of character, by the way. That was the dog. But <laughs> Kristana didn't flinch. She just stared at him. And I thought, that's so cool. She wasn't scared. She didn't play with him. She just stared at him until she had enough. And then she got up and she left. And I thought, that's what a warrior would do. See, I have this thing with new people, with everybody, but with new people, where among the questions I ask when I decide myself, are we going to cast them, is a really important question. Do you think, will the audience think they could kill somebody? Do they, you, you can do everything, they have to have all kinds of other things, but in Mortal Kombat or a movie like that, you got to believe that they could kill somebody. And real Special forces guys, real killers, are calm in that moment. And yes. there was something about her eyes looking at Kylie. I've never told her that, which made me think, ah, she's got it. Yeah, it's a it's a known fact that she is, in fact, fearless. When we had Bruce Locke on the show, he told us a story of how she picked up a snake. Nobody knew what it was, could have been poisonous, and she just chucked it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 she was great and bruce was just amazing the actors yeah. were really good too you know jeff meeks i mean he played two he played two roles in that mm. oh my god he was great Danny. one of the best actors of all time yeah he was great danny was great they, they were all great and the and the and the, and the, and the guest stars were great it was just so we got really good actors we asked we constantly asked yes. that asked that question i also like i look for a touch of the madness in their eyes are they a little bit crazy a little bit unpredictable um you know paulo was great too and he was he, the flaw in his character, which we put in his character on purpose, is he was a little too bleeding heartish. He was a little not not he the actor, but the, the character was a little too nice. He he should have killed more people. Yeah, and you know that was a yeah. I mean, so that was a that was a we built. We tried to build in those flaws. A, 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 you know, Daniel was a little too macho and a little too. I'm just going to go beat him up. And so and and you know Jeff's character is Raiden. He was a little too. Let's just have fun. Uh, you know, he, he he wanted to screw around a little bit. <laughs> Sarcastic. Yeah. yeah. So so we tried to build in yeah. flaws to all of them, and and that I I think that was the the secret to it. I I think that's why it holds up well.
And you know, there are Absolutely. the twists. Like, like like I you don't see coming that Warpax isn't really who she appears to is be. Is a part of Korea's army. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, certainly. So um the Mortal Kombat live tour is surely an experience you'll never forget. Uh, what was it like working on this particular project? That was a blast. I mean, we just we just wanted to do it. We got to open at Radio City Music Hall, and it was so exciting. And it traveled the United States, and then it traveled the world. And, and it was playing in Indiana in the Midwest of the United States at one point. And I went to see it, and it was sold out, and it was great. And the audience was having a great time. And I was talking to the guy who owned the venue, and he said, you know, this is the second biggest audience we've ever had. But, you know, the, the point is that we would go all over the world and, and see these people live, you know, jump up and down and, and, and react to it. So it was great. And again, you know, we were on this crazy schedule. I promised the CEO of Midway that we'd do it in every medium. Within days of the first movie opening and breaking records, I was in upstate New York rehearsing the tour. We just did that for years. We went from one to the next to the next, you know, to the movie, to the to the tour, to the TV show, to the next movie. We just, I did that for a year. Wow. So I believe when you were actually out scouting locations for Annihilation, you'd often run into fans wearing MK merchandise, uh, sporting backpacks and things like this. They'd often recognize you and compliment your combat hat immediately. How does it feel to know that you've positively affected millions of fans worldwide. And lastly, after everything you've gone through, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you to this day, Larry? What a great question, and thank you for saying that. So, the, the, you know, it, it's so gratifying when anyone likes it. It doesn't matter how much they like it, a little like it, they enjoy the movie. But one time after I gave a speech somewhere, a guy came up to me who'd been stationed in Iraq in the war. And he said at that time that each soldier, I, I think, got to take five or three DVDs. And they were, they had a name for them. I'm going to say comfort DVDs. That isn't the name, but it was something like that. These are DVDs that, you know, you could watch on your computer over and over and over again, but you can only take a few. And he said that he got through the war by watching Mortal Kombat over and over again every night as bombs were going off and shells were going off outside his bunker. Wow. And I, I, I thought, you know, if that's all we ever accomplished, that certainly would have been worth it. And, and there are people who come up yes. to me and say, I'm a black belt now, and here's why. So it's just wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderfully gratifying. But, but almost all that I think about is the next one. I, I, I'm gratified by it. I love it. I love hearing it. But it only makes me want to to go out and 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 make not only more Mortal Kombat movies but more other movies and touch people like that. And and I believe what it means to me is that, as I said earlier, I I believe to be truly innovative, you have to have a touch of the madness. You have to be a little crazy. You have to do things people don't think you can do. And so, the way it's changed me is this: I'm at the point where if I have an idea for a new movie or or project. And everyone tells me, oh, that's a great idea. That makes perfect sense. I get a little nervous. But if people tell me that's crazy, that's insane, it's never going to work, I, I, I get a little calm and I, I, as, as the touch of the madness envelops me and I think, well, no one thinks I can do it. I can do this again. It becomes to me like a, like a warm mist in the beach in the morning as I set off embracing the craziness and the touch of the madness and saying, okay, now we're going to go do something crazy that no one's ever done again. That's how it's changed me. And that's what it means to me. It means go for your dream. When everyone tells you it's crazy, that's probably the best time to do it. And I, that's, that's what it's meant for me. Wow. Beautifully said. Thank you. Well, it's been an absolute joy having you on the show today. We've both learned so many new things about our pride and joy. It's experiences like this that will live on forever for us. This has meant the world to all the Mortal Kombat community. But before we leave today, is there any specific project that you'd like to promote at this time? And do you have any final words to all the fans out there? Well, so there's nothing I want to promote, but I would love to know who from Conquest they want to see back in their, their own series. And I'd love to know if 
if the movie I've announced here for the first time, but not any details, called The, the Fearless and the Fallen, which is going to be a wild, R-rated, sexy, fantasy, martial arts movie. You want to see a movie like that. I'd love at Larry at Larry.Kazanoff to know about that. That's what I want to see. And to all the fans, there's absolutely something I want to say, which is thank you. And I take our and I take what we do for you really, really seriously. Everything is the audience to us. And the more we can um, give you guys what you want, that's exactly what I want to do. And there we have it, my friends. This is an episode that will always remain a highlight. Kamidogu is super excited to see all the work up ahead for Threshold. But most of all, what will occur in the world of Mortal Kombat? Conquest Season 2 with uh, a lot of the same cast returning? If I must say, that would certainly be a dream come true. Okay, people. To each and every person that stopped by today, we hope you learned something new and enjoyed yourself. Spreading the word of our podcast really helps us out, and so we'd like to implore you to keep doing that. Plus, who knows? Perhaps the next episode may or may not feature somebody else from the 95 film. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it, Chris? I think so. All right. Thank you kindly to all our continued supporters, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. You know how it goes, combatants. Have fun. Stay safe and stay flawless.